the uses of scripture are only as reliable as the person using it. Incredibly persuasive arguments can be put forward on both sides or every possible conceivable side and anchor it to scripture and, and, and it seems so persuasive because we, in the back of our mind, have elevated scripture to being the yardstick of truth. Plausible argument is not love. Love is not plausible argument. Plausible argument is of the mind, of the head. Love is of the heart. They are both centers of neurons. Even the heart is something like 60 or 70 percent neuron. I don't know, 62 percent or something. Even the spleen and the spine packed with neurons as well. The body is like a vast neuron machine. The upshot of which, or the appearance of which is, is varied. It's mind, it's emotion, intuition, feeling, even possession. Love and overwhelming elevation. All of this transpires as a consequence of the avenue of neurons within us. Take the neurons away, you have no evidence of these things in this world. Rather than how the You've changed the world because of them, of course. Theology and wisdom does not understand, does not save man any more than activities and structures. What saves us is a relationship. That's what's at the heart of families. They're in relationship. Like they're not with the man next door. Oh, well, unless they're the same ancestral tribe or something, you know. It's far, far weaker and noted by its absence, perhaps, to the man in the street. Especially in societies that are greatly urbanized. In societies that are greatly... Um, uh, ruralized, well, they are of the same stock, the same kindred. They are fun, you know, they are, well, too interbred, you might say, but hence you got the village idiot, you know, poor chap. Um, that was the typical rural Suffolk um, syndrome that you could find in a village. Suffolk, England, I'm talking about. I used to teach in Suffolk and in a rural area, Stow Upland and so on, Hadley. The Jesus story says, Father, the whole of the Jesus story can be summarized in the word, Father. Not crucifixion, not blood, not atonement, not commandments, not Sermon on the Mount. Father, over a hundred times in John's Gospel alone, that's the name Jesus has for God. Father. It's the first word in each prayer that we have. Our Father. These words spake Jesus, lift up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. It's relationship that is our security, our everything. And we are presented with a relationship of being children of God. 
he's our dad. To the world he might be this awesome, frightening, you know, to even s to see him is certain death. And the dead know nothing, they sleep. But to us, he's dead. We don't stand in awe in his presence like the angel Gabriel. We sit at table. We're in fellowship. We laugh and live together forever. That is what saved the prodigal. Not some atonement, not some sacrifice, not some scripture. He just remembered. He's his father's son. I can go home. There have been costs, of course, in what I've experienced. But home is infinitely better than this big style. And when he does go home, he's not treated like a pig. Because his dad is a fantastically wonderful guy in his eyes in the prodigal's eyes. He sees his dad running towards him and embraces him, protects love and pulls him into his heart. It is relationship that saves us. True, it's not something we've done ourselves. It's not our works and all the rest of it. Yes, you're right, I agree. And it is by grace. Yes, certainly. My dad is my dad. That's where my love is. I am going home to my dad. Bless you. Thank you, Dad. It's just add a note here, a, a, comfort, um, a reminder that the players thing, I mean, if you're watching a play, uh, you get the message, you, 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 you pick up the moral of the story, you understand the gist of things, you see what happened and, and follow the whole story as, as if it were a reality. But when you talk to the actors afterwards, you, you, you don't blame them for being the villain. <laughs> I mean, the play had to have a villain so that to make sense of, you know, the hero and, and, and everything else. Do you see, if we are actors here, it's to good purpose. Everything of our dad, our God, our heavenly father, is obviously to good purpose. Why would he make anything that was not to good purpose? So, I don't mean that when the person who plays the part of the villain, say, comes here, he's um, he must be genuinely purposed in the play, he's got to be a good actor. He plays the part. It's presumably someone who needs to play the part. Because he needs to not only perhaps know um, the reality of being a victim, a little, I don't mean overwhelmingly, but he may also need to know the reality of being the perpetrator. That it's, um, well, it's worse than you thought. <laughs> Quite simply, it's not fun. You know, it was not fun being Stalin or Hitler. 
It's not fun being this autocratic leader or incredibly affluent person or monarch. So you can come and find out that it's not that much fun. It's, it's, a, it's a, a mistake. And you can be of help and of service because you're providing the very situation that other people need to find out, which is how bad it is if you're treated this way. The victim. How bad it is to be a victim of such. But look, I'm not saying I can patch up all the holes in this um, understanding. I'm reminding you, it's a parable. Even the explanation is a parable. You can see a basic truth. You know, I mean, when Elijah... Um, is mocked by the children. Bear comes out of a forest and I think kills them. Well, I mean, this, is, this doesn't sound a very holy story, but I get the point. That in some sense, it's not good to um, have behaved like that as children. I mean, it's obviously not good to have a bear come and eat them for it, but I mean, there are holes in the story. You know, scripture isn't wonderful in being complete. If it were complete, it would be the reality. Well, reality as we see it here. You'd have, them, you'd have to be looking at a particular event. Oh, well, then of course you don't you still only see it with your own eyes and imperfections and misunderstandings and misgivings, you see. So don't blame the actors here. Act in some sense in accordance. Avoid danger if you can. And minimise it. I don't mean wipe that actor out. <laughs> I'm not suggesting you do that. People do wipe others out. Kill them. In this reality here. But it's not being commended as something that you're supposed to be doing. You may have agreed in some sense to do this before you come. Because you have to experience being such a person, acting out such a person, partly because others need it, because they need to find out what it's like being a victim of such, perhaps, but partly because you need to find out the truth that it's an awful thing to be the villain. Hmm. Something like that. Trying to get an overview of this. I do think it does suggest to us rather more strongly that evil can be here, in some sense correctly, in this world of uncertainty. If you've all agreed that you want to experience this as if it were reality, even though you know it isn't, when you make the agreement with each other, That, seemed, that explanation seems to go a long way towards even the problem of horrendous evil. 
except that it seems terribly sad that one's got to go through some simulation of evil, even. Especially in um, a state of amnesia about the reality of the situation. You see, it's okay when you watch television or you watch a play. You know you're at the theatre. You know you're watching the screen. But we are saying that people here do not know that they have amnesia about having agreed to this idea. They do not know that this is just a screen or a, a theatre stage. They enter into it rather more than that. And I'm not happy about that. <laughs> and that's why I say that we are really not actually hanging on the explanation and demanding that it be complete. For even if it were complete, the problem is still that we need to be devoted to our God. And uh, I'm not sure as perfect knowledge or more knowledge in this situation. You can't have perfect knowledge in a universe of uncertainty. So I'm not clear that it's a state you can gain here. I'm not even certain in my mind that perfect knowledge implies you will perfectly love. But I suspect it is, for instance, if that perfect knowledge also includes knowledge of how good God is, your God, and how grateful you are. <coughs> In consequence of that knowledge. Now if you are overwhelmingly grateful in consequence of that knowledge, then of course the wisdom is very helpful. <laughs> I'm not going any further, I'm getting tired. Thank you, Dad. <laughs>